It is so wonderful to see nearly a house full this morning. It, it means probably that school is starting up for a lot of us and our families and not as many people are traveling. We do have a few folks traveling and out of town today, but uh, it's good to have many of us able to be back together. We're not quite at full strength yet. We've got a few folks also that are that are homesick and in some rehab facilities, but it really is good to come together as, as God's children, and you can, you can sense, can't you, just a little bit more excitement in the air because, as you've heard it prayed earlier, and as we've been thinking about, and you've been making preparations for this, school has started back. Uh, almost all of our children had their first day of school either Thursday or Friday, and I think we've got one or two maybe that, that have their first day tomorrow. So it's, it's an exciting time for our families and, and, and our children and our grandchildren. And I want you to think back to your first day of school. Now some of you, you maybe not remember it, but just try. Go way back to your first day of school. And some of you, as you're thinking about your first day of school, you're just thinking back to Friday or Thursday because it was your very first day. We're going to, in a few moments, get into Luke chapter 2, and we're going to study, in a sense, Christ, the first day of school in, in the temple with some really smart, smart Bible people, and, and we're going to learn some lessons that we can apply from looking at that to our lives and our first day of school and our every day of school, including our last day of school. But uh, I, I want to just mention something that, that, that was very impactful in my life, my first day of school, my first day of school, I, I learned something my first day of school that I've never forgotten, that, that I try even to practice today. First day of school, I learned this. I learned to be thankful. My first day of school, I learned to be thankful. Maybe I knew it earlier. I'm sure mom and daddy tried, but my first day of school, I really got this lesson taught to me in a big way, unforgettable really. I lived, I, you, you people usually hear me say I grew up or I lived in Bruton, but that's not exactly the case. I actually lived across the river, Murder Creek, really a creek, Murder Creek. I lived across the bridge out from East Bruton. You got that, you got that creek, Murder Creek, running through East Bruton and Bruton, and, and so you cross the bridge, you go through East Bruton, you keep going, and it seems like you go into the end of the world, and you turn left on Travis Road, you go out Travis Road, you turn right on a dirt road that at those days had no name, and, and you come to my house, it was a second house on the right, down a dirt road, that's where I lived, and that was a long way, that little house was a long way from W.S. Neal School. My first day of school, I remember my mom. Now, she already was having some health issues, and she got up and got me up, and, and she, she limped, and I walked all the way to the end of that dirt road to catch the bus. Big yellow bus, first day of school, got my lunch in a, in a brown bag, and I'm excited. Mama takes my picture, and she reminds me before I get on that bus what Daddy had told me the night before. Do not miss this bus. Do not miss this bus after school is over. When the school bell rings, you run and you get on this yellow bus and you come home. Remember, Daddy said, if you miss this bus, you're going to have to spend the night at school. First day of school, all right? Daddy's telling me and Mama's repeating it. You miss this yellow bus, you're going to have to spend the night at school. She said, look at the number of this yellow bus and memorize it. Now, back in those days... And I guess it's these days when a lot of you don't ride buses, you, 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 anyhow, so maybe, but back in those days, buses had numbers like, like 1479 and 2733 divided by 4 pi, those kind of things. And I'm trying first day of school at the end of the dirt road, already going to be missing my mama and trying to memorize this bus number. By the way, I, I was thinking about this this morning, I pulled up my parking lot. I love this. Our buses, bus number one, bus number two. You can't get confused about the Tuscumbia buses out there. On our tag, bus one, bus two. I like that. We didn't have that system in, out from East Bruton back in the day. So I get on the bus. I'm sad. First day of school. And all day, 
All day, I'm not thinking about reading, writing, and arithmetic. I'm thinking about what? I'm thinking about getting on that yellow bus, making sure I don't spend the night in this terrible place called W.S. Neal School. Bell rings. I run out in the, in the parking lot, and there must be a million yellow buses. A million yellow buses. And I'm starting to scramble. And I can't remember my bus number. I just know it's yellow, and, it, and it's big, and, and I'm looking for Miss Fuquay. Now, just to tell you how times have changed, kids, when you were on Miss Fuquay's bus, if you misbehaved, you know what Miss Fuquay did? Some of you know. You older folks, you know. What did Miss Fuquay do? She pulled over and she told you, get off my bus. And what did you do? You got off her bus. You did not misbehave on Miss Fuquay's bus. You got off and Miss, Miss Fuquay didn't have to worry about your mom and dad showing up, wanting to wear her out, get her fired the next day. If you got off Miss Fuquay's bus and had to walk home, when you got home, your mom and your dad, they tore your rear end up. Now, I'm not advocating all that, but that's just the way my generation and earlier generations. So Miss Fuquay was a fearsome woman, jet black hair, about 90 years old, and an intimidator. Okay, we didn't cut up on Miss Fuquay, so that's, that's beside the point. I'm looking for Miss Fuquay, jet black hair, I can't find her. I'm running around trying to scramble and find these buses, and really there were dozens of buses out there, because everybody back in those days went to school by bus. And I'm thinking, I don't, I don't have much time. And then the most awful, you know, what do you think is the most awful sound for a, for a first day, first grader, got to catch the bus? What do you think is the worst sound you'll ever hear in your life? I still remember that sound. Sound of those engines starting to rev up. All right, and they're, they're starting to gun the accelerator. I'm thinking, I'm going to miss my bus. I'm starting to get all teary, and I'm going to spend the night. You know, you can't call them on cell phone to come and get me back in those days. And, and this teacher, this teacher sees me running around panicking looking for, for, this, uh, for this bus. Y'all remember the Green Beret, movie Green Beret? At the end, that guy's looking, a little boy's looking for that helicopter, wants to find his John son, remember? Well, that's me. That's me. I'm looking, and this teacher helps me, and she, she says, what's your bus driver's name? It's Miss Fuquay. It's Miss Fuquay. What's your bus look like? What's the number? And I, I can't remember the number, so she helps me. She holds my hand the whole way. Finally, and buses are starting to, starting to head out, and, and we get to my bus, and, and I see Miss Fuquay. I don't recognize the number, but I know it's Miss Fuquay. And, and back in those days, everybody on the bus was kin to me. Half of them were cousins, and so they, I recognize my cousins. So I'm trying to get on the bus, and this teacher will not let go of my hand. She doesn't understand how desperate a situation that I have to get on this bus or I'm going to have to spend the night. And she has the audacity, and parents explain to your children what the word audacity means after, after Bible class. She has the audacity to ask me in such a pressure-packed, emotional moment, now what are you supposed to say? I have no idea what I'm supposed to say to this woman. What am I supposed to say? Colt, pay attention to me. What am I supposed to say to this woman? I said to her, this is my bus. I thought that's what she wanted to hear. This is my bus. And it's not enough. Now, now the whole bus is looking out the window at me, you know, because I'm, I'm starting to cry. There's this mean teacher is holding on. She will not let me go until I tell her, and you know what I'm supposed to say, and I, I don't know. I'm telling her, this is my bus. This is Miss Fuquay. Let me go. I'm saying all those things. And finally, I, I, never think, I would have never thought of it if she hadn't told me. She said, you're supposed to say thank you. And I screamed out, thank you. And she let me go, and I got on that bus, and, and I have learned that lesson. I, I tell you, today, when you see the, the Holland kids, great kids. Not perfect kids, right? Great kids. When you see them picking up our communion cups after Bible class, this preacher will always say thank you. When, when I, I visit with uh, Anka and I know what some members of this church are doing for her, and when I see the people that are doing things, I always say thank you. I may not always show thanks like I should. I'm not, I'm not claiming that. But I'm just saying that, that when, I, when I, I get a message from, from Betty Ann telling me that, that uh, Percy's brother Delton is in the hospital sick, I, I, why don't I, I tell Betty Ann thank you for sending me that message? And when I, when I see Linda and her husband out, out 
trying to make our flower beds look good back behind me. And I tell her, thank you. In a sense, it really I know this, is, this may sound corny to you, but it's still, in my mind, it goes back to the day, my first day of school, when I really learned, you better say thank you, and you need to remember to say thank you. Truthfully, I don't remember learning anything else that first day. I don't know that I learned anything the first year. I should have. But I know I learned to say thank you. And we all would do well if, if you don't learn anything, really, from your first day of school or your second day. If you don't learn anything, children and us adults, if we don't learn anything from this lesson other than this, let us be thankful people. How, how much effort does it take to say thank you? How much effort does it take to show appreciation? It, it is so little. It's one, of the, it's one of the easiest things God asks us to do. And in all my lessons on Sunday mornings, I'm really trying to focus on Jesus with myself and with us. And I think about his life, and I just think about how grateful he was. And you remember even when he's instituting this Lord's Supper, he, he lifts up something that represents his bread and his, his body that's going to die for us, It's going to be tortured for us. And he lifts up something in his hands that represents, and he says, it is my blood, the blood that he will spill for us. And what does he say? He says, thank you. He says, thank you. And then later, the Apostle Paul, when he writes this epistle of joy, Philippians, he tells us, in everything, give thanks. So what he's saying is, in everything, be like Jesus. Just be a thankful person. How hard is it to say thank you? Now, I understand sometimes under pressure, first day of school, teacher hanging on to your hand, we might forget this. But typically, we're not under such pressure. We're, we're rather relaxed, and we're rather spoiled, and lots of people are doing lots of good things for us. And we dare not be guilty of ingratitude. You remember, I've mentioned this illustration before in a class or sermon or something about this, this visitor comes to the farm and, and he's very impressed with everything. He sits down with the family to eat. I mean, the spread is magnificent. And he just jumps right in and starts, starts digging in and, and eating. And, and, and the daddy says, no, 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 we, we, we offer thanks before we eat in, in our family. And so the, the, the visitor, a little bit embarrassed, puts his fork down and he, he prays with the rest of the family. And he, he says, after hearing that very impressive prayer, he says, everybody on the farm offer thanks like that? And the, and the dad said, yeah, everybody but the pigs. Everybody but the pigs. And, and so, so what I'm delicately saying to Jeffrey and to all of us is let's not be piggish. Let's not be piggish. Let, let's, be, let's be thankful. There are people that, that got up early to make sure the temperature was, was good in this building. There are people that got up early to prepare lessons to teach us today. There are people that got up early and decided what songs they were going to sing. There are people that came to this building yesterday afternoon and prepared our communion for us. There are people that will be cleaning up after us. There will pe be people at restaurants serving us, our home serving us later tomorrow today. There will be people... In, in the schoolhouses tomorrow serving us. And, and let's be grateful to these people. By all means, we are grateful to God, first and foremost, right? First day of school, I learned to be thankful. Let's, let's all learn this lesson. Let's practice this lesson. Let's apply this, this lesson. And let's be sure that as we, as we go through school, we do what Jesus did we, we do what Jesus would want us to do, and that is to do right. I mentioned recently that, that when I was directing Bible camps, we had this rule, and it's not original with me. I've seen this in many camps. You've got one basic rule, do the right thing. If we, and that's basically what the Bible teaches us from Genesis to Revelation. If you want to boil it down to one rule, do right. Do the right thing. And you think about how much better school will be if we do the right thing. It's the right thing to not cheat. It's the right thing to be on time. It's the right thing to be respectful. It's the right thing to not bully other people. It's, it's the right thing to do our best at whatever our hands find to do that's good. It's the right thing to walk over to somebody who doesn't have friends and try to be loving and kind to that person. It's the right thing to listen to the teacher. It's the right thing to not run and you know, just, just do the right thing. And if we all just do the right thing, not just in the schoolhouse, but in the church house and in the houses we live, just how, just how, just think how much better 
Uh, it's just all about doing the right. And, and, and we really, because we got such a good education program in this congregation, because we got such a good education program in our families, our moms and dads doing a wonderful job teaching our children right and wrong, it's not a question of do we know right and wrong? Do we know the right thing? We essentially all know the right thing, do we not? I mean, it's not a mystery what's right and what's wrong. There are a couple of areas we might quibble over, but by and large, we know what's right and we know what's wrong. Mark Twain tells a story about how he had one of his buddies who all his life he had this great dream of going to, to Mount Sinai. I want to go to Mount Sinai because that's where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. And he wanted to be in that place. He wanted to stand where Moses stood when he, when he, when he broke those tablets of stone in his anger. He just wanted to see what he believed to be a special place. And Mark Twain, the way he tells the story, he says that he, he told his friend... Rather than going to the, where the Ten Commandments were given, why not just stay here and do what the Ten Commandments tell you to do? And, and we understand the Ten Commandments have been enhanced and improved by the law of Christ today. But that, that's pretty good guidance, isn't it, for all of us. We, we know what the commandments are. We know what God's will is. No, anybody have questions about what God expects us to be, how he expects us to worship, how he expects us to talk, how he expects us to treat each other. No, there, again, there's no mystery in this. So let's just do the right thing that we know from the will of God and from good moms and dads that we ought to do. Look at Christ's first day of, we'll say, Bible school in the temple. This is Luke chapter 2, verse 39 and following. We will not cover all of this this morning we will cover the conclusion of it tonight but let's let's jump into this with great enthusiasm enthusiasm now Luke 2 39 and following so when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord they the they there would be Jesus and family they returned to Galilee to their own city Nazareth and the child grew. I'm in verse 40 of Luke chapter 2. Maybe the folks in the back will be able to get it up on. My monitor's off up here. You guys can see it behind me though, so that's good. I don't need the monitor on. I'm good. And the child grew. The child there is Jesus. You see it's capitalized there? Kind of helps us. The child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Children, that's what we want for you, that you will grow Growing child is a sign of a healthy child. The child grew, notice, became strong in spirit. We want you to be strong on the outside, but also strong on the inside. And notice, fill with wisdom. We want you to be intelligent and be able to use the intelligence. That's what wisdom is. And the grace of God was upon. We want God's grace, God's mercy, God's kindness to accompany every step you take in every hallway, every ballpark, every locker room, every lot, every place you go. Now, from this verse to the next verse, about 12 years happens. 12 years, Jesus is a baby, verse 39 and 40, a growing baby, and then verse 41, he's a lot older. 41 and following, he gets to be 12 years of age. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. Now this would be Christ's second visit to the city where he would die. And can we ask ourselves to think for a moment, what is Jesus seeing and thinking and feeling as he visits this place? He's just 12. He's still, in many respects, a little boy. Does he already know that I'm going to the city where one day I will suffer many horrible things? Does he see uh, Calvary in the distance, that place of a skull, and think, that's the place I'm going to die? Really? Does he, does he go to the, anywhere near the praetorium and, and think, that's the place where I will be beaten for the sins of the world? Does he, does he get anywhere near the Garden of Gethsemane and think, one day in that place I will shed bitter tears and in that place one of my inner circle will betray me with a kiss? Does he see a, a little lamb and think, one day I'll be a lamb like that and I will take away the sins of the world? 
Don't know. But I wonder. I wonder. I'm impressed that God gave Jesus parents who made having him in God's house a priority. May I say that again? I am thankful that God gave Jesus parents who made it a priority for him to be in God's house. Every mom and dad, every grandma and grandpa, we ought to, we got to, we get to make it a priority that our children be in the house of God. Why is this so important? Because this is where God's people are. This is where we can learn about God. This is where we can learn to say thank you. This is where we can learn about his will for our lives. This is a place where what good is happening in the home can be added to. It can be enhanced. We're just subsidizing, in a sense, what you're doing. We're supplementing. We're making better what you're doing in the house with your kids. Every child deserves and needs to have a mama and a daddy who have made it their priority. My children will worship God. They will be in the Bible classes. They will attend the various faith building functions and unity building functions and and serving opportunities. I'm going to see to it that that's where my child is. Now what is so distressing to me, and I'm not really preaching to you guys, I'm preaching to folks that are not here today, but maybe they're watching by internet, maybe they'll see the recording of this, but it is somewhat distressing to me that some of us who were given by God, great parents who made sure that, that we were in the church house, that we were in the Bible classes, that we were in the serving project opportunities, that some parents who were raised by parents like that are now not doing for their children what their parents did for them. Explain that to me sometime, please. How does a person that was raised up coming to the VBSs and the Bible classes and the youth devotionals and the serving projects and the and, and all the, the worship services, how does that person, when they get grown and gone, marry somebody, have their children, and say, I will not give my child the gift that my parents gave me? How, I mean, what is the reasoning process that says, I frankly am not going to put that kind of effort, that kind of energy, that kind of compassion into the rearing of my child that I receive from my parents? We do understand that if our children don't learn how to serve God from us and from God's people that we, that we share our children with in worship assemblies and Bible classes, if they don't learn to do the right thing from us, they will learn the wrong thing from Hollywood and from some of these ridiculous politicians that we have in our country and from, from the, this just overblown insistence on becoming a more worldly person that is just pumped into our culture and pumped into the ears and in in some case the hearts of our children. Every child again deserves to have parents that are like Joseph and Mary and making sure that that son, that that daughter is exposed to as much God as possible. I know you're tired sometimes. I know we've got other competing activities sometimes but what is competing with us that is more important than worshiping our God and teaching our children the kingdom of God comes first does it come first Matthew 6 33 Jesus says it comes first and I'm wearing his name I've been baptized into Christ I'm trying to raise my children to be Christians And there are great lessons they can learn from daddy and with dad and mom at the lake and the mountains and the beach and the ballpark and the mall and the house. I get that. But God's house is a special place with special people where lessons can be learned in such a powerful way. And they really can't be learned in such a powerful way in other places with other folks. And I am so thankful that I get to preach for a congregation where the vast majority of our parents get this and our elders get this. I, one one of our, what was I was talking with Thad the other day and Thad was somebody had prayed about that uh, 
or, or said, maybe I said it, I don't even remember, about how we got the best youth minister, we got the best children's minister, and I think Thad was correcting me, maybe he said, no, we got the only children's minister in the area. So we, we, we undoubtedly have the best in, in the area. But I'm just thankful we got elders committed to, to, to having a man and, and his wife on staff. to work. And guy's got a full-time job also, and trying to raise his own children, trying to help me and you raise our children and grandchildren. I mean, that's a pretty powerful message of our commitment to your children. Let's match that, parents. Let, let's match that with, with the elder's desire. And you understand. Enough on that. All right. Is it enough on that? Raise your hand if it's not enough on that. Jagger. Jagger says not enough on Jagger, put your hand down. I'm glad you're paying attention, though. His parents went to Jerusalem every year, taking Jesus with him. Verse 43. When they had finished the days as they returned, the boy. Don't you like that? You ever been called boy? Jesus called boy. The boy. Capitalized boy. Do you see that there? The boy, Jesus, lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. Verse 45. So when they did not find him... They return to Jerusalem seeking him. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what that was like for them? Mary basically has one job, raise the son of God. Keep your eye on him. She loses him. Joseph loses him for a time. Already done so much with this child. Already had overcome so many challenges running for their lives when he's a baby. And so on. And now, now she's lost him. Y your parents, you ever lost your child for, for just a few moments? You, you, you know the panic of that, right? You ever lost your child for three days? They've lost Jesus. They've lost the Son of God. Don't know where he is for three days. And you know, Luke, when he records this, kind of sounds nonchalant about it, doesn't, doesn't it, in their, their journey they return to Jerusalem. Now, you parents, you know how that trip went. Three days, they're missing him. It, basically, they're gone one day. Now, understand, there's a big company. They travel in big clans, big families. They do that for safety reasons. A lot of times, the women would be out front. The men would be out back. And I'm sure Mary's up front with all her women, friends, and family thinking, well, Jesus is back with the men. And I'm sure Joseph back here with the men. He's thinking, well, Jesus up there with the women. He's still a child. He's with the women and the children up front. And it's when they get to camp that they start counting heads, and they say, the Son of God is missing. And they sprint. I'm sure they sprint. It's not a leisurely. Probably leaving Jerusalem was leisurely. Heading back to Jerusalem, that was, that was quick. I was in Chuck E. Cheese. Don't know why, but a while back I was in Chuck E. Cheese with some kids. And I saw a mother who had lost her child. Have you seen a mother, the face of a mother that's lost their child? Full bore panic. Finally found the child. Very happy reunion. When you come back tonight, we'll, we'll see that Jesus is found. We'll examine the, the very happy reunion. We'll, we'll, we'll know. Now, this is important that we be back tonight because we're going to see the first recorded words Jesus ever spoke. We're going to see the first question he ever asked. We're going to see the, the very happy reunion that they had. But one thing that I want to get to before we close up and kind of tie it back into where we began this morning with, with the start of school one thing that we learn from Jesus and the way he talks to his parents after they find him is this. He remembered who he was. He remembered that he was the Son of God. And that helped him that day and it helped him every day. It will help us the first day of school. It will help us the first day of work. It will help us the last day we live on this earth if we always remember who we are. When you go to school, you are a child of the king. You're a special person. You're not an animal. You didn't come from pond scum. You came from your master, your creator, the God who made everything, made you. You've got to remember you're special. You also need to remember your family name. Your family name is an important name. You represent your family. You represent God's family. If you just remember who you are, how you're raised to be, how you're raised to dress, how you're raised to study, how you're raised to talk, how you're raised to treat us, just remember who you are. Jesus always remembered, I am God's child. We remember that in school, in work, in the church house, ballpark, wherever we are. We'll be the people we ought to be.
Would you pray with me, please? Father, we are so thankful that Luke, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, recorded